Are, are there any questions? No, 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 no. All right, so chapter 11, uh, 10 and 11. We're looking at bonding. And so what type of bonds do you guys know already? Covalent bonds. Covalent bonds. Polar bonds. Polar covalent bonds. Metallic bonds. Ionic bonds, right? Hydrogen bonds. All right. Um, and so let's start off with metallic bonds. Metallic bonds we're going to talk more about at the end of the... Near the end of uh, chapter 11. Metallic? Yeah. What are metallic? Like between metals? metals? Yeah, between metals. Yeah. And so, for example, when, when you think of magnesium, what's the bond uh, holding the magnesium atoms together? Metallic bond. Metallic bond. And so, uh, at the end of chapter 11, we're going to talk about the two models the electron C model. being like an ocean and so you have the nuclei of the magnesium which are going to have positive charges the nuclei are, are firmly fixed but the electrons are what we call delocalized electrons meaning that the electrons are spread out at least the, the valence electrons are spread out over the structure and so the electrons are out here in the C this is a uh, the electrons aren't, you know, fixed to any particular atom. They can move from atom to atom. Whereas the nuclei are kind of fixed in position according to the lattice structure. This is the electron C model. Um, we're also going to look at band theory. Band theory comes from something called molecular orbital theory. And so we'll talk about that at the end of chapter 11. And so we have metallic bonds, um, we have ionic bonds, we have uh, polar covalent bonds, And we have covalent bonds. And so let's take a look at these three together. Uh, can you think of something that forms an ionic bond? Sodium chloride. That's a good one. Let's go with sodium chloride. So an ionic bond, sodium. <coughs> We represent like this, Na, and uh, we ha we have a little dot here. Do you know what this is called? A Lewis dot symbol, or a Lewis symbol. And this lone dot represents the valence electron, the 3s. It has one valence electron. And then chlorine. No. Chlorine is going to have seven, seven dots or x's representing the seven valence electrons, the two, uh, th actually 3s2, uh, 3p5 valence electrons. And so what happens here? Well, if chlorine's a good oxidizer, chlorine's going to come in, take the electron. Uh, how, much, how much energy does it cost? It costs about, about 500 kilojoules per mole to strip that electron off of gaseous sodium. And then chlorine's going to get a little bit of energy back. What's EA1 for, for chlorine? Chlorine has the highest electron affinity. Did you know that? Yeah. It's about 300 and minus 340, 390, minus 390 kilojoules per mole. And so it costs you 500. Chlorine gets about 390 back. It's still going to cost you over 100 cost you over 100 kilojoules to do this. 
And so where do we get the energy back? Formation of the bond. And so how do we show the bond? Tell me how I show the bond between sodium and chlorine. With a line? No. We do not use a line. We don't show the bond other than doing this. Other than doing that. Well, if the bond's not, how, how, are they, how are the sodium and the chlorines being held together here? They're not sharing electrons. What is an ion? It's a... It's the, the ionic opposite charges. The charges yeah, the track. There, that's all we're doing here. And so basically, normally what's, what's bigger, sodium or chlorine? What would you think? Sodium's bigger. And so normally sodium, sodium is bigger, and then as you go across, what happens? It gets about, what, what do you think chlorine is? Half as big? Less than half as big? What did I, actually maybe I didn't say this. You know, when you look at the pattern, you start off on the, on the left, and when you get to the right with chlorine, it's about half the size. And so actually chlorine's about half the size. And so they start off like this, but are they going to end up like that? Nope, no. no. What's going to happen? Uh, right. In fact, um, the sodium is going to be half as big, and the chlorine is going to be double. So, you know, kind of switches. Yeah. And the sodium is positive now, and the, and the chlorine is negative. And so what's going to draw these together and hold them together? electrical attraction, the positive and the negative. In fact, the electrical attraction is going to pull them together so that they stick to each other, right? And um, we form a bond that way. This is the ionic bond. The ionic bond is just this attraction between the two ions. Now, uh, the, the way we can show that using electron density is uh, something like this. If I try to show this as the electron cloud, I have these pair of electrons here, pair of electrons here, pair of electrons here, pair of electrons here. And so essentially this is negative, you know, this, this cloud of electron density is negative here. And over here, you know, this is missing electron density. Actually, I got the color coding scheme. That doesn't matter. And so we have this here. You see all the electron densities around chlorine, the whole electron cloud. And so sodium just has the core. That's what we got. Sodium has a relatively low ionization energy, but what if we tried to bond this to something like hydrogen? Hydrogen is bigger or smaller than, than sodium? Smaller. It being smaller, is it going to be harder to pluck the electron off or easier to pluck the electron off? A lot harder. In fact, um, sodium is kind of big. Sodium is, is fairly small, and so there's going to be a bit more of a struggle here. Uh, for chlorine to pull the electron out. And so in this case, the, the ionization of, of sodium, the ionization of, of sodium is like 500. What's the ionization of hydrogen? It's like 2,500. Yeah. And so, with that much higher ionization energy, well, chlorine's not going to, to easily pull it off. In fact, chlorine doesn't pull it off. So how should I show the bond here? I show it with a line. They share the bond. Yeah. 
<laughs> there's going to be a tug of war between these two. Now, to see this, you know, well, we could we could just try to remember the ionization energies, but there's an easier way. Rather than memorizing ionization energies, sodium has an ionization energy of 500. This is like 2,500. You know, there's an easier method, and what is that easier method? Electronegativity. Electronegativity. Right. We look at the difference in electronegativity. Um, the electronegativity of sodium is like 0.7. The electronegativity of chlorine is. Is it 3? 3.5? 3.2. Actually. Wait, how do you know? Uh, how do I know? Uh, I, I don't know. That's why I'm guessing right now. Um, I know fluorine. Fluorine is 4.0. Oxygen is 3.5. Nitrogen is 3. Now, um, chlorine is, is also three. Here. How do I know? Um, I just remember this. So chlorine is three. Yeah, I remember chlorine is three. Because, do you know, I remember the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table. Fluorine, fluorine, fluorine oxygen, and nitrogen. Do you know why I have those memorized? Because of, you guys remember hydrogen bonding? When hydrogen is bonded to the, one of the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table, we have hydrogen bonding interactions which are possible. And so it's got to be four, three, five, three. But then I go, well, chlorine is three. It depends on which table you're looking at because some of the tables, the numbers are slightly different. Chlorine's three, nitrogen's three, so shouldn't it be the four most electronegative? It's the size, right. Even though they're both three, nitrogen is a lot smaller. Therefore, the numbers are the same, but nitrogen is greater in terms of electronegativity when bonded. Well, actually, I shouldn't even say greater. In terms of polarity, it comes out greater. And so, anyway, uh, we got this. So 0.7 versus 3, a 3 is going to win for sure. 3 is going to win. This is a tug of war, right? This is a total mismatch. For hydrogen, um, do you know what the electronegativity is? I have this one memorized. 2.1. Hydrogen is 2.1. Well, the reason I have this memorized is because uh, it's close to carbon. Carbon is 2.5. Hydrocarbons are nonpolar because the difference in electronegativity is small. It's only 0.4, which we call small. And so 2.1 versus a 3.0, is this a mismatch, a lopsided victory? No, this is going to be more of a tug of war. Although chlorine is chlorine is stronger. And so how do we show that chlorine is stronger, a little bit stronger? We use, we use things like this, delta minus and delta plus, right? Or we use this, the arrow, the arrow points to the more electronegative. What do we call that? We call this a polar covalent bond. The polar covalent bond showing that it, it's still a tug of war, but it's favoring chlorine. And so when we look at the electron cloud, the electron cloud looks more like this. The electron cloud is going to be biased towards, in other words, it's not going to be symmetric, it's going to be asymmetric and biased towards chlorine. Although um, hydrogen doesn't completely let go. And so chlorine doesn't completely get those. But, you know, it gets these here. These are the lone pairs, we call them. So this would be the polar covalent bond. So what holds this together? In an ionic bond, it's easy to see what holds it together. You know, you got a positive and you got a negative here. But what holds a covalent bond together? Sharing the electrons. 
Is it really just sharing sharing the electron and they hold each other's hands or something like that and they bond together or, or how do, how do they bond together? I mean, sharing electrons just doesn't do it for me because chemistry is 100% electrical interactions. If it's electrical interactions, I need to hear positive and negative, right? And so what is the positive, what's the negative? What's holding it together? Chlorine is negative. Well, maybe we got this. We got the partial charge, so it's a little bit like this, right? But there's some more to it that, that's holding it together. The, what's more to it that's holding it together is, is this. In the bonding region, we see that the, um, the electrons, these electrons are kind of confined in the, the region between the two atoms here. And so when we look at the positive charge of the nucleus here and the positive charge of the nucleus here, the positive charge is going to be attracted to where the electrons are. And so where are the electrons? The electrons are between the two atoms, and therefore the two nuclei are going to be held together. Does that make sense? Could you say that again? Okay. So the, the reason why the hydrogen and the chlorine are bonded together is because the nuclei are attracted to where the electrons are. Where are the electrons? in the middle area here. And so that's what holds these together. If there were no electrons here, then the atoms wouldn't be attracted to each other, right, in, in that sense. So they could still be because of dispersion forces. And so these, the purple is attracted to the blue cloud regions. And so this hydrogen is going to be attracted to the chlorine because of the electron density there. Which is different from the ionic bond by. Well, it, this is this is a little bit different because here we have fully charged species, and they're just uh, like uh, they're like sticky balls. Here, this is a little bit different because um, density. Yeah, this isn't the fully charged, although it's partially charged. It, it could be held together because of the charges, you know you got a partially charged hydrogen and a partially charged chlorine. And so what happens here is that the hydrogen is going to shrink down, right, next to nothing, and the chlorine is going to grow quite big. So we get an attraction like that, okay, partially charged. But in addition to the partial charge attraction here, these are naturally going to be attracting each other. Yes. We have electron density concentrated in the internuclear region internuclear region being the region between the two nuclei here. And that's what holds it together. We have to talk about this because we, we got to go to covalent bonds next. And so what holds the covalent bond together? And so if we take a, let's do this. We're going to match a chlorine against a chlorine. Chlorine versus chlorine, who's going to win? No, no, no. no one. It's going to be a tie. And so here they share the electrons. So what holds the two chlorines together? You could say, oh, sharing of the electrons holds the two chlorines together, but that doesn't do it for me because that's not one of the, um, you know, we, we need gravitational force. Maybe the gravitational force is holding it together. We got electrical force. We got these nuclear forces. Are there any other forces? Oh, there's the holding or sharing electrons force where they can be a piece holding and sharing the electrons together. Is that a force of nature? No, it's not because of the sharing of the electrons, but it is. You know, you can't just stop there. You have to explain it more. So explain it more. What holds the two chlorines together? Well, you could say it's the sharing of electrons which concentrates the electron density in the internuclear region, which means that the nuclei are going to be attracted to that electron cloud into the internuclear region, holding the atoms yeah. together in a bond. Something like that. You know, but sharing of electrons just doesn't do it. Right? And so you've got to say that the nuclei here 
are going to be attracted electron density. Well, they can be attracted electron density up here, 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 but there's electron density, density in the here. And, you know, this electron density that's concentrated here, well, the two nuclei are going to be pulled towards that. Something's wrong with that. I know they're working on it upstairs. Really? Thanks. So we got an electrical attraction. You know what? What holds ionic bonds together? Electrical attraction. What holds polar covalent bonds together? Electrical, electrical, electrical attraction. What holds covalent bonds together? Electrical, electrical attraction. Electrical attractions are what holds. Thanks. What holds bonds together? And so you have to understand, you know, visually what 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 is what is the electrical attraction? Right? Sharing electrons does not hold uh, the atoms together. All right. So uh, we want to form bonds. So why do molecules form? You know, I I might have mentioned this. When you think about most of the elements on the periodic table, most of the elements occur in nature as elements. Well, no, most of them occur as compounds. And so why do compounds form? Stability. Stability. Making bonds means that things can become more stable. stable. Right? And so, yeah, we want stability. So, especially here, you know, two chlorine atoms, highly unstable. Chlorine molecule, much more stable. But chlorine still isn't that stable, right? You know, chlorine is quite reactive. Um, well, why should chlorine be quite reactive? The electrons? I mean, it's got an octet. This chlorine's got an octet, that chlorine's got an octet, it's done, right? It, does it want more than an octet? What, chlorine? No. Well, chlorine doesn't want more than an octet. Because if, if it has more than an octet, then that extra electron has to go into the next shell, which is totally unstable. And so let me ask you this question. I, if chlorine's already got an octet, then chlorine should be stable like water. Right? But it's not. Why not? The bond is weak. The, this bond is actually not that weak. This bond, the chlorine-chlorine bond is um, in the high 300s, 400, 300 kilojoules per mole. In other words, visible light is not enough to break this bond. Bromine, yes. Bromine, the bond is kind of weak. And iodine, it's weak. And so bromine, why is bromine a much weaker bond? Well, one thing is, it's because of its, if this is chlorine, Bromine is much bigger. And so when the nuclei are much farther apart, it's much easier to split this. Iodine, even bigger. Visible photon comes in, can split bromine. We get atomic bromine is quite reactive. Visible light comes in, it can split iodine. And so bromine and iodine have to be protected from light. And so uh, bromine and iodine are never stored in, in, in uh, colorless clear containers like this. They're stored in amber brown containers that block off light. Because of size? Or? Yeah, because of the size. You know. So the bigger the size, the easier it is to break apart. Right. But, um, okay, so, but this is a much stronger bond. You know, fluorine has a much stronger bond too, stronger than chlorine. And so this bond is fairly strong. You know, this is going to take at least UV to break this. I forgot how much it's, and I think it's close to 400, maybe even over 400. <coughs> well, anyway, um, so the question is, why is chlorine so reactive when it's already fulfilled its mission. Its mission is to get the octet, right? To become more stable. And so it's done. Mission accomplished. Huh? 
It's not, yes, it's nonpolar. What, what, what was it? I'm sorry, Jessica, I missed her. No. Because Chlorine no does not have more than lactate. Because no hydrogen bond. It, it doesn't because um uh, let's let's talk about chlorine getting more than lactate. If chlorine goes to chloride, it's filled, it's shell. But if chlorine goes to Cl two minus, now that extra electron actually goes into the next shell, and Ea two on this is is very unfavorable. Ea two is much much greater than zero, meaning it's highly unstable highly endothermic. EA1 actually is less than zero. It's exothermic. So this is good. Mm -hmm. But EA2 makes this uh, a deal killer. This just doesn't happen. Uh-huh. Isn't there like some exceptions to like the rule though? Like, I don't know, I landed like There are. Like, after, like, further but not with chlorine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, actually, the, well, let me take that back. Yes, with chlorine, there are some exceptions, potentially. But not in this sense. It's not, um, it's not gonna be a free ion like this. Okay, let me tell you why. Um, one is, it's always relative. Chlorine is perfectly stable, right? You know, like chlorine, um, if you had a cylinder of chlorine, is there a shelf life on it? Like if you if you um, bought a cylinder of chlorine um, to um, chlorinate your pool or something like that, maybe they they do have that. I think at those big Olympic swimming pools they have it as chlorine gas. But I, I'm not sure. Um, is there a long shelf life on it? That is, does chlorine only last a day or two and then it's bad? It goes bad? No, it, it's going to be stable as long as there's nothing to react it with. But you know, what? why is it reactive? It's reactive is because it can react with other things to form even stronger bonds to make things that are even more stable. Like for example, sodium chloride. You know, if chlorine comes into contact with, with sodium, it's gonna form sodium chloride, which has strong bonds and is quite unreactive. The other thing is chlorine's a bit greedy because in this sense here, even though it has an octet, it has an octet by sharing, but if you look at its oxidation state, what is the oxidation state here? Zero. What's the oxidation state here? Minus one. So what do you think chlorine wants? To be zero and sharing or to be minus one and keeping? Minus one and keeping. And so this is minus one, and then sodium chloride, it's minus one. And so we already know um, some stuff uh, about you know, the oxidation states that can help us in understanding bonding and reactivity. All right, so uh, let's talk about um, drawing Lewis structures for um, the first part. The first thing we'll talk about is for ionic compounds. This is going to be your ad hoc analysis. When we look at a crystal of sodium chloride, solid, do you see molecules of sodium chloride in there? No. What you do, uh, when you look at sodium chloride, you see a sodium ion and then a chloride. And then a sodium ion and then a chloride. Sodium chloride. And so on, like this. Actually, let's draw the sodium it's a little bit bigger. See a crystal? This is what we call the crystal lattice. In other words, if you have positive balls, if you're a positive ball, what would you want to surround yourself by? Negative. negative. And how many negatives do you want? If you're a positive ball, do you only want one negative ball next to you? No, you want as many negative balls as possible. 
And so how many negative balls can I fit around one positive? Four in the plane, and then not only do you want to be surrounded in the plane, you want one above you and one below you. So all together, we're going to have six. And so when we think about sodium chloride, sodium chloride just doesn't have one bond. It, each sodium in sodium chloride has six bonds to the nearest neighbor. But this is electrical, and electrical interactions occur through space, right? You don't need a direct connection, you don't need a line. And so if electrical attractions occur through space, then we got attraction here, and then not only that, this sodium is gonna be attracted to this chloride, which we call the next, next, next nearest neighbor. And so this is the way that when we try to understand the structure of sodium chloride, we have the nearest neighbor interaction. Uh, nearest neighbor is favorable. The next nearest neighbor would be unfavorable because that's another sodium, so they don't like each other. But the next next nearest neighbor would be favorable. And then we add up all those electrical attractions and subtract out all the repulsions and then we get something called the lattice, the lattice, the bond, bonding lattice. which is delta H of the lattice, which is not equal to delta H of the bond. When I do, when I do a delta H of the bond, that's for breaking one bond, like a chlorine-chlorine bond, right? When you do delta H of the lattice, are you just breaking one bond? No, you have to tear apart the entire lattice. Did you mean they're not equal? So not equal. They're not equal. They're not equal. This is for a single bond. Um, I shouldn't say single bond. I should say lone bond. All right, because they're double bonds and triple bonds. This is for a lattice of bonds. This, by the way, is, is chapter 10, 11, 12. This is chapter 12. So how do we draw the Lewis structure? Well, the Lewis structure is we could show one formula unit. This is called a formula unit. Lewis structure, we need the electrons. I can't forget them. And uh, the brackets show the net charge. Or we could show multiple formula units to try to get the lattice going. And so to show multiple units of this, you know, we just use this. Etc. So we just make this into three dimensions, right? So this is for um, Ionic compounds. Uh, let's do another example of an ionic compound. What should we do? I got an idea. Let's do um, sodium carbonate. <coughs> Why don't you draw the Lewis structure for sodium carbonate? Well, let me draw the, the Lewis structure for carbonate ion first. Okay, this is the Lewis structure for carbonate ion. Now, carbonate ion is interesting. Um, it's going to have a net 2 minus charge. But that charge is a result of these circle charges here. There's a minus one charge on this oxygen and a minus one charge on this oxygen. These circle charges are called formal charge.
All right, so draw the list structure for sodium carbonate for me. almost done for you. Sodium carbonate's an ionic compound, right? It's a, a salt. How do you show an ionic bond? Do you draw a line attaching the sodium with the carbonate? No, that would be a covalent bond. This is ionic compound, so how do you show an ionic bond? Hmm? You don't, right? You just draw them next to each other. So, you know, the, I said you, you're almost done with this because let me just show you all you have to do. All you had to do was this. The sodium plus here. But the thing is, there's two of them. So where should I put the second sodium plus? Probably on the other side because remember, we want to surround as many negatives. We don't want positives around sodium, right? It's unfavorable. And so this would be what's called a... We call this a, we, should I call this a molecule of sodium carbonate? Is that right? The appropriate language for this? No, I'd never call this a molecule. I'd call it a... Hmm? I'm almost done. Finish this for me. Formula unit. This is a formula unit. Why don't I call it a molecule? Somebody tell me why I would not call this a molecule. A molecule is what, it's discrete, right? 
It's a discrete unit. But um, this isn't a discrete unit because it's going to look like this once I build up the lattice. So which two sodium should I pick? Which carbonate should I pick? You know, does it build? Do you see that? I, all I have to do is pick two sodiums and one carbonate, but there's no unique. You know, this is not unique here to say that's a molecule, and this is not a molecule, right? And so all I need is two of these small ones and one big one, and I'm done. So this, this, would this be a molecule of sodium carbonate? It has a 90 degree? No. Would this be a molecule of sodium carbonate? No. It, there's no molecule of sodium carbonate. Instead, it's formula unit. Now, sodiums are, are spherical. Carbonates, are they spherical? No. And so it's going to look a little funny because all of a sudden, um, you, you know this shape, what we call this shape? We call it trigonal planar. And so all of a sudden you have balls and triangles and you got to stack them together in a crystal lattice. Right? Flat triangles. And so this is how the lattice is going to work here. You think having balls and triangles is strong or not as strong as having, let's say, balls and balls? Less strong. Probably less strong. It depends on how it packs, you know. And uh, actually, sodium carbonate is versus, let's see, what else? Sodium oxide. You know, carbonate's a 2 minus, oxide is a 2 minus. And so which one do you think would make a stronger lattice? Sodium oxide or sodium carbonate? Sodium oxide for sure. Why? One oxide is a heck of a lot smaller than a carbonate, and then you can pack them in a lot tighter, a lot closer. Okay. And so I'd expect the sodium oxide to have a much higher melting point than sodium carbonate, because when I melt this, what do I do? I break the ionic bonds and free up the ions. That's what happens. In terms of solubility, you know, um, well, there are other factors that we have to consider in terms of solubility. And so, uh, remember, for, for um, ionic compounds, ionic compounds would be like a metal and non-metal, like this. We never draw a line here to show the bond. We just draw the ions adjacent to each other, and then the attraction is going to be between the positive. In this case, it's going to look like this. The attraction is going to be between a positive sodium ball, like a sphere, this is positive, and a negative carbonate. We got that attraction, electrical attraction. Actually, two negative. All right, next we're going to look at um, covalent bonds. And so, uh, taking a look at covalent bonds. Um, We're not going to be dealing with ionic compounds. We're going to be dealing with what? Ionic compounds have ionic bonds. Covalent bonds are found in what type of compounds? Okay, ionic bonds are found in ionic compounds. Covalent bonds are found in? Covalent compounds, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Like between... Metals. Yeah, between nonmetals. And so, what types of covalent compounds do we have? Like, okay, covalent bonds are going to be found in what? Covalent bonds are found in uh, polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions, like uh, what we just saw carbonate. Where's the covalent bonds in carbonate? The carbon's 
And the carbon-oxygen bonds are covalent. These are polar covalent because there's going to be a little bit of struggle. Oxygen is a 3.5. Carbon is a 2.1. So there's going to be a... Oxygen is stronger. So in polyatomic, we have a double bond here and two single bonds here, right? Why it has to be polyatomic? Well, don't we put the... There's a monatomic... Monatomic, th there's no bonds in monatomic. If you have a monatomic ion, like oxide, this is the oxide ion. Where are the bonds? You have to have two or more atoms to form a bond. One atom doesn't form. Hmm? Yeah. So it's got to be polyatomic to show. Where else do we find covalent bonds? Diatomic. Okay, diatomic molecules, or just we'll just call it molecules. So we find covalent bonds in molecules, like uh, oxygen, O2. O2, is this what we call a polar covalent bond or nonpolar covalent bond? Nonpolar, it's a tie, 3, 5, 3, 5, even. 3, 5, 3, 5 is going to have a symmetric electron cloud in, in the bonding region, like this. This is symmetric. A th 2, 1, 3, 5 is going to have a asymmetric electron cloud that's going to favor oxygen. Favors oxygen, meaning that um, we have what we call a polar bond. Even though we have a polar bond, you look and you see, when you look at this, is this more isotropic or anisotropic, the electron cloud? It's more isotropic because it kind of looks the same, although this is a double bond. And so we'll see that there's no net polarity here, but we call this a monopole because it has a net negative two charge, not a dipole. Okay, so we find covalent bonds in polyatomic ions, we find covalent bonds in molecules. Where else do we find covalent bonds? In what we call network covalent lattices. You know, I just talked about the um, <coughs> sodium chloride lattice, right? We talked about that. We talked about the sodium carbonate lattice. Uh, what is a network covalent lattice? You've never heard of it? No. You've heard of diamond? Yes. Okay, How, what's the structure of diamond? Well, is, is diamond made up of carbon molecules? N no. So what is diamond made up of? A network covalent lattice. What is a network covalent lattice? It's this thing that just keeps going. So do you, have you ever seen these wedges and dashes before? Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, do you recognize the shape? Tetrahedral. And so what we have is we have a whole bunch of tetrahedral carbon atoms that just keep going and going. Where do they stop? You know where they stop? They stop at the end of the crystal. At the end of the crystal, you're going to have things called dangling bonds where it just stops there. The surfaces are less stable than interior atoms. And so this is what we call a network covalent a lattice because it's just a lattice made up of, rather than having a lattice made up of ionic bonds, you know what we call a lattice made up of ionic bonds? Like a salt crystal, you know? This would be a, a covalent <coughs> lattice. So that's harder to achieve? That's why there's value in that? Like no, these are rare. Rare and they're pretty and they're hard. 
you know, diamonds have a, it, it's hard to break apart this lattice. Have you ever tried to melt a diamond? No. If you try to melt a diamond, what's a, what's a bond energy? A carbon-carbon bond, you know, even though a carbon-carbon bond is only 347, is it right? 347 kilojoules to, per mole to break that. But if you're trying to break it, if you, in other words, let me ask you this. Is the delta H of the lattice equal to delta H of the bond? The delta H of the bond is just 347 kilojoules, which is not that hard to break. You, you know, just some UV, boom. And so, you know, do you have to protect your diamonds from UV light? No, you don't. But you do walk out in, in in the broad daylight with diamonds because you you know that they aren't going to break apart with UV because because they have repair enzymes that <laughs> repair <laughs> any bond damage. No, um, you know uh, because of the lattice. Because of the lattice, yeah, yeah. Think about it. A photon comes in here, boom, breaks this bond, right? But you got all these other bonds here. And what happens? The photon comes in here, breaks this bond, but by the time this bond's broken, this bond reattaches. You know, like that? Because it's unstable. And so what you need is you need a coordinated attack of four photons striking at the same time to break this off. So you get four photons, coordinated attack, break those, and then you can take that carbon atom off. Is that going to happen? With much probability, no. This is lattice is very difficult to break. Wait, so we can't break it? Like, not even the lattice? Well, well, the other way to break this is not to shoot photons. The other way to break this is just to heat it up. You heat it up and get it hotter and hotter so that the vibrations get so big that it breaks the bond. You know, the, you got these crazy vibrations. It's like, what did I see? Something. I saw the uh, an example of this with a like a a, a kid's playground, you know, some spring or something. Oh, it's one of those little horses with a spring like that, and this adult was going back and <laughs> forth like this, and the vibrations were getting so big that it, it broke the spring. And, uh, uh, it's probably already weak, but the same thing can happen here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, um, you, you got this lattice of bonds, so it's very difficult to break. Um, and so what we're going to do next is we're going to look at covalent bonds, um, and we're going to do some Lewis structures and stuff. But um, we'll take a break uh, first.